Hey everyone, welcome back to the DevNet Create Theater. We have Alex Ellis coming up next. He's the founder of OpenFOSS, uh, talking about going serverless. So uh, take it away, Alex. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. So um, it's great to see so many developers out here at the conference today. I want to talk to you specifically about a kind of API, serverless APIs. And we're going to get from zero knowledge to serverless in 60 seconds. I'm going to tell you about a project that you can run anywhere. And that's really important right now, where we're looking at privacy issues and ethics issues with some of the companies that we've come to trust and some of the larger brands. Well, with an open source project, you can run things however you want. And that is really going to unlock your data, make sure that you can be happy with your systems. Um, just give me one second, and we'll get the DevNet deck up. So we're going to look a quick bit at OpenFAS, what serverless is, how you can use it. And then I've got some case studies as well from the industry that might just make sense um, and, and help it tie in. So when we look at serverless, we're really thinking about an evolution in how we design our systems. The chap from Google earlier told us about monoliths and how they broke things down with microservice architectures. Why did they do that? Well, monoliths did far too many things. They were actually really hard to test. You release them every six months, right? He was talking about nightly builds. Microservices did fewer things, and they allowed us to move faster. Well, functions actually allow us to go even faster than that. And one of the great things about functions is that unlike with microservices, where we now have to maintain individual configurations for every service, they can be largely managed in exactly the same way. And we can just use sane defaults. We can use pre-made Docker files so that you have a really slick experience and you can get your code out to production quicker. Now, functions are small, reusable chunks of code. You can compose them together to make new workflows. And you can also use them to talk to your microservice and your monoliths. So it can actually be a great way of integrating all of this together. A little bit more about functions. They're short-lived, so they tend to run for maybe a second or a few seconds maximum. They have no state, so they don't have a database inside them. You can't guarantee that the call that you made is going to come back to the same function again. They're single-purposed. They tend to take an input and produce an output. So they're really good at doing just one thing. And then we, we generally don't have to manage them. They look after themselves, or a serverless system will look after them for you. And these are all things that mean that we can move faster and we can focus on writing code rather than worrying about a lot of the things that come about with a microservice. Now, this is the cloud-native landscape from the CNCF. It was actually interesting to hear about Kubernetes directly from Google this morning in the keynote, because the first project of the CNCF was actually Kubernetes. And since that was adopted, look how many different projects have come into this space. Serverless has this category right here. And it's blossomed and bloomed so fast. It's such a speedy area that it actually has its own landscape now. And OpenFAS is just over here under the Kubernetes native section. Now, why is that important? Well, when you come to use a piece of software, you want to know that it's backed by the industry, that it has validation, and that it makes sense within the context of the wider picture. Okay. So, let me give you a quick example of serverless in the industry. This is an Amazon Echo Dot on the stage. Can you see it? Now, the way this works is it's like a front end for serverless. If I talk to it right now, my voice will be uploaded to the cloud, passed to JSON, and a Lambda function will run just for a half a second, probably, and reach out to a weather service, maybe something like Yahoo Weather. And then we're able to formulate a response. So it's perfectly suited for this kind of application. 
Lambda functions work by writing some code in a web editor or creating a zip file on your laptop and uploading it to Amazon's system. Now, you can only write in the languages they support, like Node and Java. And then once it's up there, they'll completely look after every aspect of it for you, including the billing and the life cycle, and only get billed for what you use. Now, you can actually replace Lambda for Docker and OpenFAS, but why would that matter? Well, you should be able to write your code in whatever language suits your team and your business. You should be able to run that wherever you want, whether that's in a hybrid or a mixed cloud, even on the public cloud. You should be in control of that, and forever long is necessary. Right? Some of these frameworks have an arbitrary time limit of five minutes. You can run your open fast function for as long as you want, and you should be able to do that. Now, I've created a developer skill for my Alexa I want to show you. Has anybody heard of Let's Encrypt? Do you know what an SSL certificate is? Right? Let's Encrypt give you free certificates, but they only last for three months. So you have to renew it. Now, I built a skill here. So rather than checking the weather, we're going to check our, our certificate. And automation is hard. So rather than automate it, I've got a skill, and I'm going to ask when my blog is going to expire. Alexa. Open certificate bot. Which site should I check? You can say check open files or check my blog. Check my blog. The URL blog.alexelis.io expires in two months. Right, so I've got two months and then I have to renew it again. And this is just an example of how you can start to combine existing functionality with OpenFast. Now, the certificate checker is a function in the function store that you can just deploy whenever you like. And I wrote an Alexa skill in Node.js, combined the two together, and we're able to create that demo. Right. That's just an example of what you can do. So you may be wondering, well, give me a bit of background about OpenFast. How did it even come about? Well, I was there writing these Lambda skills for the Alexa, and I'm a Docker captain, part of the Influencers program. I knew how to do things in a container native way using a container image. The reason why we use containers is because it's the same thing everywhere, right? No more works on my machine. So when I came to work with Lambda, I was confused. I didn't really understand it. And I built a small prototype and entered it to DockerCon called Hacks Contest. I won that, presented on the main stage. Since that time in May, we've gained over 11,000 GitHub stars, an industry award from um, InfoWorld. We have use cases of where people are using this in the industry. And one of the things I like most about the project is it's community driven. Most of this growth has come from the community. I actually have two of the core contributors from the project in the audience here. And what's really great is to get validation from the industry. I've now been hired by VMware to work on this full time to contribute to it. And it remains in the community. Now, this is actually a quick cross-section of our community. And we have people from all over the world, all sorts of time zones. Um, and there's 91 individual contributors. So 91 people have contributed code to this project. And this number just keeps going up and up. 2,000 commits. And together, we're building this project for you to use to give you an open source alternative. Now, just to talk about a couple of people on here, I could say we have Frank Pommering over there. He learned about OpenFAS. He's a .NET developer. And he started giving his own trainings in Germany. How cool is that? Two weeks ago, seven of these people organized on their own to go and speak at meetup groups about OpenFAS. And so what we're finding is this is really relevant to developers because it's made by developers. We're making something we want to use and we hope you want to use too. So the code is written in Golang. We have an API gateway at the top. This is the broad architecture. The gateway is where you would define your functions. Once you've defined it, they'll each get their own route. We just use a default to keep things simple, right? A function and the name of the function. There's a RESTful API, so you can program against this if you want to. We then collect metrics using something called Prometheus. It's an industry standard tool. 
When we can detect that the function's being called very fast, when there's a spike in traffic, we can scale your function up by adding more replicas using Docker Swarm or Kubernetes. Now, those tools also give us really um, robust infrastructure. We can take a whole bunch of machines and collect them together. And we don't have to worry about managing them individually, installing patches. We can use something like Google's Container Engine or Microsoft's AKS service, a hosted Kubernetes, where all you do is install OpenFAS and then use our API. The system will manage itself. Now, the reason this says Docker at the bottom is because every function we build is a Docker image. That's important because we've learned so many lessons from building Docker images. We want the same code to run everywhere. We want to be able to scan that, put it through an enterprise workflow. We may already have microservices. Well, you don't have two sets of deployments here. They're exactly the same. Everything can run on your existing Kubernetes cluster. Now, one of the things that um, I want to say about the project is we have this tagline, serverless functions are made simple. And that is a core driver for the project. It's like a compass. It tells us what we should be doing. Now, it's great to be here at DevNet because we're developer first, made by developers for developers. We have a CLI and a UI that have a lot of attention. Not every project comes with this but it allows you to get straight where you need to be in an unsurprising way. You can install this in 60 seconds, and we're going to see that very shortly. It's operator-friendly, which means once you get back to work and you've done your POC, you'll be able to convince your boss because we're building on battle-tested technology that you can run anywhere. We're removing those objections. It's Unix-like, which means that each component can be swapped out and can be worked on individually. You can customize it. And that brings me on to how this is a community-centric project. I showed you that picture of all of those people contributing to this one project, all engaged, giving meetups. Um, even see Eric, one of our core contributors, has come all the way from Seattle just to attend and support. You know, it's a very vibrant community. We have calls every couple of weeks on Zoom, and we all get together and share what we've been doing. It's a really welcoming environment. Now. Why I put developer love here is because we're finding that developers love this platform, and they go and tell other developers about it. In fact, one of our contributors lives in Austin, and he's been going into work two hours early to work on a prototype of OpenFAS to convince his architect that they should be using it. And that reminds me of my early days when I got involved with open source and with Docker. And maybe you can relate to that, too, on some level. right? So let's just get into a demo. I'm going to deploy OpenFAS in 60 seconds on a Kubernetes cluster. And what I'm showing you here is we have no pods at all. And I'm now going to run in the configuration. So in Kubernetes, you have YAML files that describe what should go in the cluster. That's, that's live. That's up and running now. That's less than 60 seconds. Um, we also have a Helm chart, which is another way of packaging Kubernetes applications. And here we go. Here's, here's the UI. And from here, we can deploy a new function. This is the store that's built into OpenFAS, into the UI, because we want to make it easier for you developers to actually try this out and see how it works. Now, I want to give you a demo of a couple of things. I'm going to start off with one called Inception. This is a machine learning model that allows us to take a photo and figure out what's inside it. So if we were to go over um, to Google Images, we'll look at a picture of an, an animal, something like a, a brown bear. I'm going to send that into the function, and I'm going to see if it can figure out what it is. We're just going to get the address of that, call up the function. Here, I'm putting in the request body. Right At the top, it tells me what the, the name is, what Docker image it's running from. And I'm going to hit invoke. Now, this is machine learning, so it takes a couple of seconds. And we've got our score back, and we're 98% sure that was a brown bear. 
Why am I showing you that, right? You could just go and do this in Python. We were able to package this code from someone else and make it into a function. That meant that it had an API for free. We now get metrics upon that, and we can auto-scale it. We can push this to the Docker Hub. We can share it with our team. We can put it in the function store. And this is part of how we can start to take blocks of code. This was a promise of software development, reusability, and it never really happened. Well, with functions, you've got this reusability. You can take this function and use it in any application you like. And one of the other things that's really cool about functions is how they can scale. So I'm just going to show you something that's quite rudimentary here. This will generate us uh, an ASCII logo. And as soon as it's downloaded, the button will come available. And it's just going to give you some text back. Now, what I want to do is run a small load test on that. And so I am going to be running that from my laptop. This tool is called Hey. It's just going to generate some traffic there. And then I'm going to show you a monitoring tool for Kubernetes. And we should start to see the function getting invoked on this graph. Let's see how we're going. 405. So here's the figlet container. And you can see that arrow is showing you the traffic that's going into it. It's running at 15% of the CPU. And in a moment or two, we should actually see that scale up because it's noticed that there's a lot of traffic there. And we'll get the additional replicas added onto the screen here. And that's how we're able to scale for demand. Now, this project's called Weave Cloud. You can install it on top of your Kubernetes cluster and get some visualizations. And then over in the UI, we, we have the invocation count coming up there. Once that has finished um, running, it will scale back down to one replica again. So you're only really using what you need. So let's have a look at how we can build our own functions. So I think that's probably what you're starting to think is like, OK, so you've showed me this Python example that's in the store. I now want to think about how could I use this at work. Well, what we have provided for you is a CLI that can scaffold the basics of your function. You'll get where you write your code, and you will get where you say what dependencies you need. You can actually use an existing binary. So that example of Figlet used a Unix utility. It wasn't even code. It was just running a binary. You can use an existing Docker image, and by putting a function watchdog part of OpenFAS inside it, it can become serverless. It's really easy to adopt anything uses pattern. Some of the main programming languages we're already supporting are .NET Core, Node.js, Java, Golang. But you can write this for any language you like. There's no restrictions. This is how we scaffold a function. So using the CLI, if you do FAS CLI new, put the language in there, and then a name of it will generate you the, the code block. So we've got a, a very basic handler here that is going to go off and ping a website and come back to you. I've then told it that I, because it's Python, I need requests as a module. That's a pip module. What will happen next is that small bit of code will get combined with a Python template, which has a Docker file in it with all the best practices that you can imagine, like running in an Alpine Linux, a very tiny container, non-root user. And at the end of it, we'll get a Docker image, right? So you don't have to worry about Docker. You don't have to learn it. We'll maintain that for you. You just write your code, focus on doing your job. And then we can deploy that to a container registry. And from there, it can go into OpenFAS. Does that make sense? Yeah? So just to zoom in on that, 
this is an example of, a, of what a function might look like. It's just got a handler. It takes some request in that you've posted. It could be binary. It could be text. Here, I'm then going off and saying, get that URL for me. And I'm just going to return back the status code. right? So if it's file found, it's 200, not found 404. But here's the thing. Those four lines of code, once they're deployed in OpenFAS, are an API. You can now call that from wherever you want. You can scale it up and down. You've got full metrics on it. It's running through Docker on Kubernetes, and you don't have to worry about any of that. So this is how an example would work from the whole flow, right? You're calling the function like we just did in the UI. We may pass in a big picture, and we just have a function that resizes it a little bit smaller, building a catalog, let's say. This takes a second. It will go into the gateway. From the gateway, we look up the function, pass the data in, and we get a response back. And because it's all working over HTTP inside, if something goes wrong, it's really easy to debug it. You can see exactly where the data is. But what if you had 40,000 images, right? And they took one second each. That would actually take 11 hours to process. This is where asynchronous functions come in. And here, we can actually probably load in those images within three or four seconds and then allow them to be put into a queue and processed when there's availability in the cluster. Now, this is really powerful because if you have those five lines of code from earlier, you've now got a fully robust deployment in Kubernetes. You've got the ability to run this asynchronously, and you could deploy this whole system in 60 seconds. You get all of this built in. There's nothing compl complicated here. Instead of going function, you put async function. That's it. And it calls it exactly the same. Now, there's a whole bunch of people that have started to use OpenFAS for various different reasons. I'm going to tell you some of the use cases and give you a community example first. And we also have lots of integrations. Now, some of these have been built out by companies, and some of these have been built out by individuals like myself, contributors in the community. An example of one done by a company would be HashiCore's Nomad. Nomad is a container scheduler like Kubernetes. Nick Jackson, that works as a developer advocate, part of his work has been to create a backend for OpenFAS. We also have one for Docker Swarm. There's one for DCOS in the community, too. So let's take a quick look at an example from the community. I'm going to give you four, four or five examples, and we'll wrap the talk up and give you some practical um, actions to take next. This is Colorize Bot. And part of running a, a project in the community is interacting with people from various different backgrounds. This is two 17-year-old developers from the UK, Finian and Ollie. They had this idea to turn black and white video into color. And we took it one step further and turned it into a Twitter bot. And you can actually use this today. You want to take a photo for later at ColorizeBot. You send any black and white photo, and within a few seconds, using an OpenFast function and the asynchronous processing will come back to you and tweet it back. Like it's, it's really, really cool. A lot of people use it for family photos and Doctor Who images. So if there are any Doctor Who fans, um, you, can, you can use this too. So I just have a quick picture here I can show you for a demo of some trees. And we'll be able to tweet this off. and then. In three to four seconds, that will come back, and we've got the color image. Now, we didn't need to write a lot of code for that. In fact, two 17-year-olds were able to develop that pretty much on their own. Think back to when we were 17. What were, what were we doing with computer systems? We're probably working with PHP, VPS. We're having to manage everything, maybe using the LAMP stack. Today, we can move so much faster. and. It, if you can see what we've been able to achieve here, imagine what you could do at work when you put your minds together within your larger team. And that's the photo that's just come back. So the way Colorized Bot works is there is two microservices. There's the OpenFAS gateway, 
and just a bit of code that lives for a long time, listens to the tweets from Twitter's streaming API. Every time a tweet comes in, the picture is stored in Minio. That's a kind of S3 that you can run wherever you want. The picture is then colorized, and then asynchronously we'll tweet it back to you when it's done. And that, that's how it works. If you want to check this out, it's available online. Now, moving on to um, some real life use cases, this is Anisha Kashavan from the University of Washington. She is a postdoc and she's a data scientist. What she's trying to do, and you can see a picture just here, is to crowdsource segmentation on images. Now, if that sounds a bit technical, it's because it is. This is a hard problem. What she's doing is getting people to outline lesions and problems on medical images, collect that data together to train a model that can then be used to save people's lives out in, in the field. Some very, very cool stuff here. If you want to take a picture, you can try it out at testmedjelina.com. Now, Lucas Rosler works at Contiamo out of Berlin. This is a startup, and they are using OpenFAS to build a data science PaaS. What does that mean? Well, Jupyter Notebooks are where you can do your data science. You can define what tests you want to run, what simulations you want to see, and you get your graphs out the end of it. They are taking this and building it for you continuously so that you can share the results of that within your team. So within an organization doing research, once you have an algorithm or an optimization you want to test, they're able to give you public URLs for that, automatically building it through OpenFAS. Jason Leonard at Citrix has been building out a whole UI and dashboard for OpenFAS for their test engineers. Now, they write PowerShell scripts. Remember how I told you you can run OpenFAS functions in whatever language you want? You can do them in PowerShell and Bash as well. So he designed this web UI, and people within his team will just type in their tests. They're testing things like routers and virtualization. They can then save them and run them whenever they want. Now, they don't want to use Kubernetes. They know Docker Swarm really well, and that's OK. They're able to just use whatever makes sense for them. Just Noppen got in touch with me from um, BT um, Research. It's a bit like AT&T in the US. He'd been using OpenFAS for seven months, and we met up the day before I flew out here, and he told me that they'd been using OpenFAS to share experiments within the team. So he supports 140 research engineers who are doing things like trying to find the best way to allocate resources, people, to different jobs like traveling salesman problem, things like that. They're trying to find out the best way to schedule work. So what they do with OpenFAS is build out these algorithms, and then they can deploy them and share them with an entire team and get feedback really, really fast. With microservices, the problem that you have is that you have all of these Docker files. You have all of these manual services you keep having to check on, or you have to build some complicated workflow. OpenFAS has that built in. So you can just focus on solving the problems. He also built a deployment pipeline, which I think is interesting. Three of the people on, on these slides have built their own CI and CD for the functions. So as we start to wrap this talk up, we'll have a bit of time for questions. I, I want you to think about what would you tell your boss about OpenFAS? Well, this allows you to build your own platform the four people that I just showed you, didn't, they weren't satisfied with the experience of cloud functions. It just didn't serve their purposes. They were able to build on top of OpenFAS a completely custom solution for what they needed. They were able to iterate faster. They can share their experiments. They can share their code with a company and with the internet. They can use any language, PowerShell, right? What cloud platform supports PowerShell? I don't think any of them do. Now, it's very important for you to own your data. What's been in the news recently around Facebook has told us that that even more applies today than any other time. And 
This is something that I think really applies to this community, is the ability to unlock community within your team. Because this is an open source project, there's a sense of your team coming together, maybe over a distributed location, and building something together that they can all be proud of. And with OpenFAS, you can do that today. So I want to announce a new project from OpenFAS. And I think this is going to help the people that I showed you. Because what, what this enables is you to create your functions in your workspace on your laptop, push them to GitHub, and get them deployed automatically without doing anything else. Now, sometimes this is called Git Ops. Heroku did this really well back in the day. But now we can actually do this with serverless. And the Alexa skill that I showed you, I ran through this mechanism. I defined a new function on my laptop. I pushed it up to GitHub. It then took my name, and it took the repo name, and constructed a URL with HTTPS already enabled. It packaged it by cloning the repo, checking out the specific SHA, building it in a Docker image, and then deploying it. Got a rolling deployment. Now, this is an early stage, and it would be great to get your feedback on it. The other thing that's really exciting about this is when you think about serverless, some people are put off by that idea of managing your own servers. With something like this, you can deploy it on premise with GitLab or Bitbucket, and you can give the serverless experience like Lambda to your entire team, but actually take care of it yourself. So look, I want you to get involved with this project. There's three practical ways. The first is you can join the Slack community. Now, normally, you'd have to email us, give a quick introduction, some background. But for the next 24 hours, if you want to take a picture of this, that short URL will get you directly in. You can use the QR code or the URL at the top. A limited time. If you miss it, don't worry. You can just email us. Um, the second thing that I'd like you to do is to take the workshop. The workshop is a series of hands-on labs. We actually have seven or eight of them now. They've been built by the community. And they teach you all of the things that you, that, that you may be wondering right now. How do I set my dependencies? How do I scale this up? How can I work with different um, parts of the system? We're also running that in the conference tomorrow, two separate occasions. So look out on the calendar. And the third way you can become involved is you can become a contributor. I said we have um, actually have several contributors in the audience. We have Eric, Carol, and Jock. And I'm really happy that they're able to come here. And you guys can become a contributor too and get on that slide so that next time I do this talk, it's going to be your face there too. All right. So look, thanks for taking the time to come and find out about OpenFAS. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them after the talk. And just check it, check it out for yourself. All right. Awesome. Oh. Take it afterwards. Here we go. So you you are from VMware. So VMware has a product similar to what serverless called Dispatch. Have you heard about it? So um, a bit more background then. I started OpenFAS around 15 months ago as a own time project. And you saw what I was able to build with a community. Well, one of the, one of the things people don't tell you when you start an open, open source project and it gets really popular is that everyone expects you to support it for free 24 seven and create every feature that they could ever imagine. And they're not necessarily willing to help you out with that. that that's open source. You love it or you hate it. You got, got to deal with it. So I got to the point where people were telling me, look, you've got so much traction with this project. How, you know, how can you keep it up? Right? This, was, this was my baby. This was our baby. I didn't want to see it um, go to waste. And I got approached by a number of different companies. Some people wanted to take the project completely away from me. They maybe wanted to close source. And then one of the opportunities that came up was to work directly on OpenFAS as a third-party contributor full-time and build a small team around it. 
And so I really, was really excited to join VMware around five weeks ago and to be able to contribute to this as my, my main focus. We're building a small team as well. I think it's really important to see the industry backing it in that way. Now, Dispatch, we actually have Carol from the front. Maybe you can catch him later. Dispatch is another project that started around the same time, I'd say. And they were looking to add enterprise features on top of an existing op op open source project. Right? So within VMware, there are actually three projects that might be interesting to you. Open FAS, Dispatch, and another one from Pivotal called Riff. And they have a slightly different flavor. They have a slightly different community. Dispatch is looking to add enterprise features like Active Directory integrations, some certain stuff like vSphere as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you, uh, Dispatch, if you like, we'll wrap uh, around. Uh, I mean, there are so many uh, serverless vendors providing many options, but uh, uh, I know majority of the ones are kubeless. is more, you know, top of Kubernetes, and then uh, Google has its own you know, and then everybody has its own. But why VMware is going to a different direction than what a traditional virtualization on top of a, a, a serverless functionality really required? I, I don't understand the question. I mean, I mean the, the dispatch uh, product very, very much similar to what OpenFast. No, okay, okay look, um, we can talk about this afterwards if you like. Dispatch is looking to add value on top of an existing open source project by adding some additional enterprise features. Does that make sense? Have a chat with Carol afterwards. Um, look, don't, don't think you have to ask a question on the mic. I'm just going to be here for the next few minutes. Just come up and grab me. All right, there's some swag on the table over there. If you go through that door, you can get um, some stickers and postcards. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Great stuff. Get involved with OpenFast, definitely. Thank you. All right, so we have a lunch break coming up here, so enjoy your lunch. And then at 1, we have the uh, Camp Create kick uh, kickoff, so please join us then. Thank you.